Dave here, how are you? Today is the 4th of October, 2020, and what a glorious day. You can hear the cicadas outside. What I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna duck outside, you can have a listen. This has been an unbelievably noisy year. But I'm gonna, down the other end of the shop. Can you hear that? Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, a heap of them. I don't know if that's gonna mean a wet year for us or a dry year, I have no idea. But the weather is absolutely beautiful, 26 degrees Celsius outside, who could ask for more? Daylight saving has started in a lot of places uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. New South Wales, which is the state in Australia, which I live in, complies with that. So Australian Eastern Daylight Time, as we're going forward for the next six months or so, the show will be on at this time. So if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you may end up going falling back one hour. So it might be a two hour time difference. Just a heads up, on the show today, on the show today, you could hear the cicadas. Man, oh man, unbelievable. So the sound and the image is good. If I come over to this side, I found the pictures possibly a little bit sharper because I'm towards the middle of the image. You see that uh, on that side over there, where I've got the chat, that's, um, that's stealing part of the camera's vision. So if I was to go without that on the side, I would now be centered in the image. And so with these cameras, they're very sharp in the middle, these little webcams, but they're a bit soft on the, on the sides. There you go. Uh, Louis, hey Dave, is that the new cutting station in the back? Yes, Louis, it is. Can you see it? It's, uh, I love it. It's my old station, but I rebuilt it. So I've done a whole lot of stuff on that, and I will do a video on how I did it all. Uh, there's some really, really nice features in it that I'm not going to tell anyone about quite yet, and I'm still making a couple of things to go with it to work with the, um, with the track for the Festool track saw that are very innovative. I've never seen anyone else do what I'm about to do with it. So keep posted. Morning, Brian, how are you? Uh, the Tongue Drum Project. Now, I haven't done any more tuning on it during the week because I've been flat out because Vicky said to me, I want some drawers in my kitchen cupboards like you've done before for me. So there's another three banks of drawers that I'm building at the moment. And also I went down to Sydney University yesterday uh, for the first match of the cricket season, took my camera, took a couple of shots. I'll show you a couple of those a little bit later on. And also um, <clears throat> Vicky started there working as the day match manager. How cool is that? And she had an absolute ball doing it. You smile ear to ear all the way home in the car. <laughs> uh, so waiting for that one. Are you Louis? Excellent. Okay, um, the, the, as I said, a couple of photos and uh, the cupboard drawers. Now the cupboard drawers, I want to get into that as quick as I can. I'll do, show you a picture of what I've done so far. Where are we? This is the uh, title picture without the text on it. And you can see that on the front, the leading edge of each drawer on the top, I've put a piece of jarrah there, which is the same as all of the doors in the kitchen are. Now, the reason I've done that, that's a high wear, high impact area on any drawer. Ordinary tape, I would have thought would end up tearing off over time. So that's why I've done it with Jarrah. And I've built the drawers similar to what I normally do, but with a couple of small changes. Now, to put these drawers inside, I'll come back to here. To put the drawers inside an existing kitchen cabinet with doors on it already. Remember, I've got these doors, are all Jarrah doors, all around my kitchen, and I love them. I don't want to change those. And I suppose I could have taken the doors off turn them sideways and then reshape them and do all that kind of stuff so that it was just a drawer without a door in front. But the thing is the grain would be going a different direction. So at the moment, all the grain is up and down solid panels. That's what I wanted to keep. The, draw the doors are held on with cup hinges, you know, European style cup hinges. So as they come out, that's fine. But the thing is you can't mount drawer slides, full extension drawer slides, directly inside there because the drawer is going to collide with the cup hinges, with the knuckle. So I'll show you what I've done to alleviate that problem. 
Now you'll notice in between the two cup hinges on the door, which doors on the left, I've created another panel, which is 16 millimeter melamine, and I've edge taped the top and the front edge. There's no need to do the back and the bottom. I use HMR MDF all the time when I do this stuff. So you'll see that now the drawer slides are mounted on that secondary panel, which has kept them proud of the, uh, of the knuckles on the, on the hinges. And that works extremely well. So when it's shut, it looks lovely. So back to here. Um, and I'll quickly have a quick read down the side here. Carl, uh, I get my weekly blessing of Dave an hour early tonight, then <laughs> switch to DST in four weeks. They will have to come to my house two hours earlier, one for Australia DST and one for US DST. Good, so daylight saving time. So you're dropping back. Yep, uh, Giles, hello everyone from Shannon, Quebec. How are you Giles? How is your course going in woodworking? I'm curious to hear how people are doing with their uh, progression in this kind of crazy thing that we do. Creative, it is creative. All right, let's get into uh, working on this drawer. Now I'll show you one of the drawers that I've already finished. This is it. So this is a drawer carcass. Jarrah on the front and pocket hole construction underneath and at the back, edge tape around the top and jar on the front. It's pretty easy. I'll put this down. Now when I say it's pretty easy, it is if you get the measurements right. Oh, and the other thing I need to tell you about the drawers is you're going to lose space in the cupboard, but you're going to sometimes less is more. And I'll explain what I mean. The side panels that are going to bring the drawer slides in to give them clearance past the cup hinges they are 16 millimeters thick each. So it's 32 millimeters straight away. The pair of draw slides, all up, 25, but I always allow 26 millimeters wide for the pair. I try never to go too tight. If you go too tight, the things jam. If you are slightly narrower in the, in the width of your drawer, maybe one or two millimeters, it's not gonna make any difference in the world. It's still gonna slide beautifully. All right, now, Wayne, I will, we'll keep that one private. <laughs> okay. I think he'll be blushing now that she's watching the, <laughs> watching the show. Where was I? Now, also, the other thing is we're going to have two thicknesses of the melamine for the actual draw carcass. So there's another 32. So let's add all that up. We've got 32 times 2 is 64 millimetres of melamine plus 26 millimetres of slide. In my book, I think that comes to 90 millimetres in width to the inside of the drawer that we're going to totally lose. Depth, we're going to lose around about 30 millimeters in the depth because we've got a drawer, the front of the drawer, but no drawer front. This is just a, a raw front of the drawer and the drawer's rear and possibly four or five millimeters clearance at the back so we don't smash into the back of the unit. Good morning, Ben, how are you? So having said that, the drawers are just fantastic because there's none of this, you know when you put something in the bottom of a cupboard, so you might have one shelf, so kitchen bench, one shelf, and then the underneath. And anything that goes in that bottom is never to be seen again. <laughs> I made comment on uh, Facebook that I had lost uh, food articles in there. And when I pulled it out, it was 2011 news by date. Not good. So with the drawer, I can slide, every, slide the drawer right out and I'm looking down totally on all the contents. And I've got three drawers in each of these units. And man, oh man, what a difference it makes. You can organize yourself so much better. So losing that 90 is, is, is nothing. It's, it's a plus. I highly recommend if you want to do something like this, you've got an older kitchen like mine. I built mine 20 years ago. So, and I didn't want to change it around. I love the, I love the Jarrah, you know, I, I just like the look of timber. Everyone's going for white or gray these days or black. I've got black bench tops, but everything else is Jarrah. The black is there to highlight the color of the timber. That's left over from photography. Always I put a black background to make the pictures pop. White makes it look a little bit insipid. Anyway, that's me. 
a wasted space above. Okay, okay, you lose some storage space, but the space you have is far more readily available. Ex exactly. So let's get stuck into it, and we're going to do it. Now, what I did was, as I said, I did stuff one up, and I've got, I've got all these. <laughs> this was going to be one of my fronts, but I got the measurements out by 10 millimeters. So this has now been trimmed down because the rear goes in between the two sides. The front goes right across the front. So I had edge tape on the edge. I do that first. Then I put the jar on top. Uh, so I had to cut it down. And this is now going to be the back. I've already pocket holed it. It's going to go at the back in between. So from inside the drawer, this is what you see. From the back of the drawer, which is hid hidden in the cupboard. No one's going to see that. That's where the pocket holes are. You regain all the space lost by removing all the out-of-date products. Right, <laughs> exactly right, Mike. Right, let's go. I've got a piece of timber over there. The table's all ready to go. Uh, going to make my own kitchen with plenty of drawers, so very timely for me. Exactly right. G'day, Harry, how are you? I'm going to switch the cameras over, put the eye muffs on, and rip this piece, this new front, down to 185 millimeters, and then we'll dock it on the capex, glue some jarrer on it, Let's get started. I'm going to switch this over. So I've got the, can you see me there? Hello. <laughs> uh, where are we? Eye muffs. And I'll make sure I've got the dust extraction in the right spot. Turn it on. I've got overhead and underneath working here. Check that both of them are open. They're not. They are now. And I also have the Craig Foreman open as well. All good. Now that'll work. I've got it set at 185. Turn it on. That blade I just used in there is Amana Tools double-sided melamine blade. Look at that. Tiny chip there, but the rest, absolutely beautiful. All right, very happy with that. Now, swing the camera over this way to the capex. I'll do a quick check that you can see what's happening. Yep, cool enough, back a touch. Now on my drop saw here, I also have a port at the back. I can pull it open. So whilst I'm cutting, I've got the dust extraction coming straight from the back here, pulling down through, through a little cyclone and, and away. But also right across the back where I've got this mounted is a slot right the way across and a box underneath here. So this is actually a collection bo box that I could mount a dust port to, and it runs under the unit and back to the main system. So when I turn it on now, you can hear that pulling from behind. All right, glasses, and I've got to quickly check what length this has got to be. I think it's 527. I think so. I'm hoping. Let's dock one end and see how it's a real rough kind of finish on it. Yep. First thing is I'm going to do is do a scribing cut and then I'll drop it down to do the full cut. A little bit there. See that? That's how you do it. It's the same as I do with the, uh, with the track saw, with the TSO guides and all that kind of stuff when I'm doing a long rip, when I'm breaking down a sheet. You know that I drop it down two millimeters, do a reverse cut, 
go all the way down to possibly five, six millimeters below the board so that the blade is cutting up from the underside. It's all about the direction that the blade approaches the, the, uh, the product. Flip her over and make sure of that length. Now I'm pretty sure it's 527 and I'm pretty sure I've got a tape measure here, but I'm going to check because it would be horribly embarrassing if I get it wrong. Yep, 527, cool. Now, for those that haven't uh, watched what I do here with the capex for distance, I have a right to left hand tape running out this direction and a left to right hand tape going out that way. Now you'll notice also that when I bring this all the way up to there, I've got a cursor here that's on 30 millimeters back here and that's giving me 30 millimeters from there to there. So I set it up so that when it was at naught, that's when I cut it then I pull it back and so this point is referred back to here always. So 527 now is going to be back up here, which looks a whole lot longer than what we've got, but we've got that distance from there to there as well included. So 527 and on this cursor as well, I've got a couple of slots on the, on the cursor so I can undo and adjust it depending on what tape measure I'm <laughs> using. All right, 527. I think that's the end. They're both so clean. I'll throw these on again. And start the sound up. You might want to turn the sound down just a touch. sometimes when I'm doing the live shows that I that maybe I don't slow down enough to get the exact measurement. <laughs> I'll come back over here. Uh, where are we? Back here. Uh, quick read. Get the thumbs going. <laughs> Measure lots cut even more often. Uh, Jenny, hello. G'day Jenny, how are you? Uh, morning, Dave. Good morning, all. Apologies for the tiredness. Um, that's fine. That's that's fine, Mr. Fix-It Fingers. Okay, where are we up to now? That's right, we've got this. I've got my piece of jarrah. I've already ripped the piece of jarrah. And I've dressed, I've dressed one base. Now, this is 15 by 15. So when you, before you actually do your cut, so you dress one face first or one edge, then do your cut. And then so you've already got one edge dressed, ready to glue. Now, you might remember that I've said to everyone with Jarrah, you can't use this kind of glue. You've got to use epoxy. Well, I'm being a bit cheeky on this one because I'm in a bit of a hurry. So I'm going to glue this on with Type Bond 3. So there's my piece of wood. And see, I've, I've been told that it's not going to fail for 10 years. Well, in 10 years' time, we might be putting a new kitchen in. So. And if it fails, well, I'll just get a cup of my nail gun, bang, 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 <laughs> pop it back on. All right. Just like an ordinary sauce bottle, we give it a squeeze. I'm only going to put glue on there. And I'm not putting any tape on. I don't really need tape. In this situation, it's not an internal corner of a box. And Carl Cam. Uh, where is it? There we go, up to Carl Cam. So you can see me painting away here, putting the glue on. Isn't it great having faster internet? So I can do this with great color and no stepping nice clean fluid frames 
Watching it back on a TV is easy. I'll put this over here, get it out of the way. And, and I have stuffed up. I'm an idiot. This is what happens when you start to rush things. Not to worry, we're gonna, we're gonna quickly come back. I'm gonna tell you why I stuffed things up. I haven't put the edge tape on. That's the next thing I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna get a rag, just pull that glue off. It doesn't matter because all that glue is gonna do is seal the edge of the particle board. It doesn't matter. It's just a waste of glue, that's all. And glue is not going to stick to the melamine. This glue won't stick to it. So it doesn't matter if I get it on there. Okay? It's all over my fingers now. Oh, the joy of it all, the joy of life. All right, now, Peter, you'll notice this little iron down here. Peter Lisiak in the comments there gave it to me. He said, Dave, I got one for myself and for my wife, or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe she got one, or maybe Wendy got it for you. And he said, it's fantastic. So I have been using it. Now, if you get one of these, I think they have them at Spotlight. If you're in Australia, that's, that's where I think they got them. Um, or could be Aldi, but I think it's Spotlight. Turn it on flat strap. Turn it right the way up. Don't turn it on to maybe half or three quarters. It's not going to get hot enough. Now, the type of tape that I use, and I'll show you what I'm going to do. Whoop, I forgot to turn this on. Give me a sec. There you go. You're going to, if those on Facebook, you're going to get another post straight away. <sighs> As I said, this is what happens when you're doing live stuff. Uh, for those who don't follow me on Facebook, this is a Lazy Susan that I've mounted a round chopping board to. That's all it is. So now I have a mount that I put on the Stanton bench, and then I put my tape on the mount, on the, on the um, Lazy Susan, and I've got a five kilogram weight left over from when I thought I'd be Arnold Schwarzenegger. And this now is, I, look at that, do you like that? So I can pull that out to whatever length I need. Now before I do that, I need to put this in here, Catch it with my knee, you see that? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to throw the clamps on, drop it down the front. That's one. Have I got another clamp there? Come in from the other side. The iron is at temperature, held nicely. Pull the tape onto what I need on there. I've got a red light on the iron, That's it. which means I'm ready to go. Now the tape that I use is fantastic. Get a block of wood and run it over the top. Wherever it is, there it is. I'll hit it again with the iron. Reactivate the glue. I've seen some people use a piece, of, a piece of dowel and go like that with it. I find that I can rock around a little bit too much doing it that way, and it ends up being a headache. All right, so now I've got it there. Next step, end trimmer, little pair of shears, slide it on. That cuts it off. And you'll know if the glue is the right temperature because these will stick to the inside there. If they don't stick, you probably haven't got the iron warm enough. All right. Now, if I had another piece here, I wouldn't run the, the uh, trimmer that direction. I'd come from this side and go that way because going past, you may end up pick up the edge of the tape that's already existing and peel it off. 
There we go. Do you like that? <laughs> and my little chamfer plane, this little guy here, this does a 45 degree. Gives me a nice, nice finish. That, was, that end's done. Does a magic job, doesn't it? I love this stuff. I do it. A, I've repeated doing this a bit over the last couple of months. The reason being, it's what I'm doing at the moment. It, and it's just, you like that lazy Susan idea. Use it for whatever you want. It's just such a good dispenser. So I wind it up again. Here we go. You want to watch? <laughs> Tear it off. Put it back. Iron is still on. And I got a red light. And make sure that the iron is running over flat. Not rocking. Sometimes what I do is uh, I'll roll it a little bit on the final passes and one at either end. But this tape that I've got from that was um, Trademaster, I think I got it from in um, down in Sydney. It's great tape. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, now the reason I'm doing it on the front of the drawer which is also doubling up as the draw front, is that it will be seen. Um, do the sides. There's no tape there. It's fine. And that's done. This one. Done. Done. Okay. Back to where we were, kiddies. Now we're going to put the glue on. This part has never happened before, obviously, has it? <laughs> and turn the iron off. Done. Peter, it's a great iron. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much. Now, I'm a little bit obsessive about things. I like to have plenty of space. So I put things away as I'm going along and I don't get tripped up. Rather than just ending up working in the corner of where I'm at and going, oh, no, not enough space. Done. All right. Glue. Here we go. It's already starting to go off and opening the end always helps. <laughs> doesn't need as much because it's already had that first dose. And here, I'm going to show you a trick. You may know it already, but I'm going to show you a trick on clamping that makes life very easy. There we go. A nice amount of glue. Right, there's this. And get a couple of clamps and go to Carl Cam. Have a quick read down here. It's amazing how many things you get out just, just for a simple job. Yeah, it is, it is a simple job. You get stuff out and it's all over the place. The next thing you know, you're tripping all over everything. You've got nowhere to work anymore. I, tr I really do try to just put things back. When I finish with something, even if I haven't totally finished it, if I'm going to use it in another 15 minutes, I'll put it away. I, that's just me. All right, let's go to Carl Cam again. And we've got our piece there ready to go. And we'll get a couple of clamps. I'll use a couple of the Bessies. So what I do is that's the that's the item I'm going to glue. I'm going to put this on top, and as I say, I've got that edge dressed. 
it's going to sit on there. I'm going to lower down. Now, I, my clamps are messy. Messy, Bessie. <laughs> but the trick is, I get another piece that I've already prepared and stuffed <laughs> that I'm going to use as a piece that will actually push really hard against it. I'm going to turn it over because there's a little bow there. Ah, it's because it's pulling up that way. See that? You may not be able to see it, but it's open up a little bit there. So we can turn it around. That's fine. Now I can pull this up on this one. Check the ends. I leave just a touch on. You see the glue squeezing out now in the middle. Now these are pretty good. That's not going anywhere. I can feel underneath. And I am just slightly towards the other side. Tripping over things already. So I'm going to throw a couple of these on either end to start. And I'll put another clamp in the center. So I'm putting a clamp directly over the end, not on this part, but it's on that to that. So it's, it's, it's lining them up. So you understand what I'm saying. Now I can't make these reach into the middle. I can't reach into there with those. So I've got a deep throat clamp here that I'll use. So these things have got a nice big length in them, so I can throw that on in the center and clamp it. And that, my friends, has pulled the joint perfectly underneath. Now I'm going to leave that. I'll switch cameras again. Back to here. Now I'm going to leave that for 30 minutes. So right towards the end, we're going to do a little bit more with this. We may even run over a little bit if you're happy enough to do that. I just wanted to show you that. All right, so I'll move these out of the way. Over here. And let's have a look at some of the things I was going to talk about. There it is. I knew it was hiding. <laughs> All right, we're going to have a look at Paul Mumford's uh, partner, wife, uh, we're going to have a look at something that she has created. Now, it's not woodworking, but you know that I did ask for people to send in their better halves projects if they're inclined that direction. Yes, they are. Uh, no, it's a 300k body. Revo. My favorite clamp. Parallel clamps. There's all different brands. I just like these ones. Um, it's a buy once, cry once thing. I've had them for ages, and they work like the day I bought them. Um, <laughs> David, I understand that, your problem with the uh, half-finished job, half jobs. You do hear Cicada singing, Andrew. Isn't it beautiful? I love it. So back to Paul. Uh, hi, Dave. Some weeks back, you mentioned on the show that you would like to see group members, partners, projects. Although you wouldn't describe Shelley's project as woodworking, I'd like to show it to you anyway because the result astounded me for its accuracy, design, and the amount of work that went into it. This is a Japanese themed pitchwork or patchwork bedspread made for our daughter Sophie in her favorite colors. Now, let me see if I've got the. There you go. To start, the calico backing sheet was laid out in a grid by pencil. Uh, Paul's only input to the job. After that, each of those little clouds was painstakingly arranged in a specific order and hand sewn to those surrounding it and to the backing sheet row by row on the grid. All in all, there are 520 of them. Okay, children, count them all. <laughs> Next picture. The inner border was then attached and the entire quilt was sent away for quilting. <coughs> Pardon me. On its return, Shelley attached the other borders and the final hidden hem 
on the edges of the outer border was hand sewn to complete the project. The quilt is approximately 1600 by 1600 and took many hours to complete. I hope you like it. Regards, Paul. What do you think about that? Isn't that amazing? The amount of patience. Now, if, if Shelley had got that wrong, she wouldn't have been smiling like I was when I got, got a draw. Well, it doesn't take long to make another draw. That is hours and hours in that project. That's just amazing. So, Paul, thank you very much for sending that in. And as I say, if you've got a, a better half that does things, it doesn't matter if it's patchwork or if it's um, painting or if it's creations with glass or woodwork, send them in to me. My email address is in the description box down the bottom. It really is worthwhile sharing. And also, it, in, <laughs> there's, there's kind of a reason to help you out as well by doing it. See, if you do this next thing when you go off to the shed, and if your better half is saying, you're always in the shed, you're never up here with me, they'll be a little bit more lenient with you, I think. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, okay. Um, I'm not going to show you about the tongue drum yet. The reason I'm doing this other stuff at the moment is we're waiting for that glue to go off. As I say, it's got 30 minutes. So around about 5-2, I'm going to pull it out of the clamps and we're going to do a little bit more work on it. So we'll take it over to the router table. Um, well, some, one thing that we can do as well at the moment, how about, while we're waiting for things to happen, I'll turn the other camera on down the other end of the workshop and we'll do some pocket holes with the machine because it's nice and quick. Uh, this is part of the draw base that I make. So I've, I've done five of them. I've got one more to do that I, I just left for the show. Yes, Ben, we saw your wife's uh, stand, which is fantastic. We, it was beautiful. Do it. Send stuff in. All right, I'm going to switch cameras again. We'll go down to the pocket hole machine. And why am I there as well? Maybe just camera three. There we go. You guys chat amongst yourselves while I spin the camera around. Don't get too scared. Okay, that should be okay. I'm going to come back and have a quick look at the monitor. Yeah, I can turn it just a bit more. Now, I had mentioned that my dust extraction runs pretty much everywhere in this workshop. And the trick is to turn it off and turn it back on to the areas it's going to. So I'm going to shut that one off. And down the back here, I built a, a bit of a port into the back behind the Craig Foreman. So I can open that up now. And that's on. Turn her on. Hear it sucking. That's amazing. All right, this is the draw base. I look for what I think is the best side. There's a bit of a tear out on that. Some of this stuff has been scrapped. So I'm gonna put this side down. I'm gonna put three pocket hole screws on each side. Turn that one around the right way. Uh, maybe if I bring this up here a bit further, you can see what's happening. All good. These swing stops are handy. I just push that in and up to it. There's my first one. Just going to center, so I'm looking at the distance from there out to the edge, just roughly centering it. And along and back to there. So that's three pocket holes done pretty quickly. So we'll speed it up now. I'll turn that off for a second. I'll point out a couple of things about this. This is a pneumatic Craig Foreman. I'll tip that up just a touch. You should still be able to see it. So when I pull this, what happens is 
this clamp here pushes down to hold what's going to hold the sheet down so it can't lift. The drill comes up out of here at an angle. Now what I've done with this one as well for these particular drawers is even though I'm using 16 millimeters or 5 8 thick material, I'm using inch and a quarter screws. Now how I've managed to fudge that is I've loosened the screws that hold the two uh, machine screws that hold the bar down to the top here and I've pushed it back a little bit. So what's happening now is the pocket hole drill isn't reaching right to the back right to the back edge anymore. It's it's staying back a little bit. And you can tweak that up so that you can use an inch and a quarter screw which gives you a better bond than the inch does for this thickness material. And it does when you do it it leaves enough of a hole leaves enough of a hole here so that the head of the screw isn't proud. But it's very fine tuning so it, it, it's handy to know. Now when I do this I've got I've got three more holes to pop in. You'll understand you'll watch this go down. Um, I'm not going to do it. I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll slide it up the side there and you can watch the drill come up. So the clamp is going to push down against the surface. You'll see the drill come up out of there. You ready? Now it's running off my compressor, which can keep up. I've had to get a larger compressor to run this thing. Um, these, I don't know if they do these much anymore, but they do do an electric version now. And from all accounts, does just as good a job. All right. Or you can get the manual one, like the K5 or the K4, if you wish. All right, dust on again. So watch the clamp. And into the middle. And the last one. That's it. All right, I'll go up the other end. And back to here. It's good fun. I love it. All right, let me have a quick read. Amazing, Paul, you've done a great job. Um, okay, on behalf there, yeah, blast gates. Uh, cool, it's a masterpiece. Hello from North America. Hello, Adam. Uh, Leslie, you have to go, so we'll look forward to watching later. Thanks, it's not a problem, Leslie. Uh, do you call Craig George? Um, I don't know. I don't know. What, explain that one, Wayne. Um, George the second? I don't know. Uh, Dave, do you know if the Canberra Woodwork Show is going ahead in November? No, no woodwork shows this year. All being postponed to next year. I need something to drink. Good. How's the time going? 22. Um, <laughs> just do a little chat in the meantime while we're still waiting for that to dry. Uh, the other night I had this dream. You're going to probably all start turning off now, but it's funny. It was so real. I couldn't believe it. I dreamt that I had sent something to someone overseas, a parcel of some sort. I don't know whether it was a, 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 a coffee mug for patrons or what. I don't know what it was, but I dreamt that I'd sent it by intercontinental ballistic missile. <laughs> and the dream was so vividly real. I was wide awake, woke, woke right up, and I had to check my emails <laughs> to make sure it wasn't true. Can you believe it? Oh, what an idiot. Anyway, that's just between you and me. Don't tell anyone else. Um, George Foreman Grill. Oh, the Foreman. Okay, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. No, I don't call him George, but maybe I should, Wayne. Maybe I should. Anyway, next thing, next thing, next thing. I did mention I went down, I took some photos at the cricket. Um, this is something I used to do as, you know, the, as part of an income supplement. I used to get paid to do it. It's one of those things where I have a look around my workshop. I have an obsessive nature. So my son used to play cricket for Sydney University many years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. And I, I'm not a cricket fan. I don't like watching games of cricket. 
Vicky, on the other hand, loves cricket so much that now that she's actually working there again, doing stuff for the club. So uh, I picked up a camera because I thought, well, this will relieve my boredom. So I bought a little camera and you know, I was getting what I thought were great photos. And then one thing led to another. I was looking at these photos and I think I can do better than that. I think I can do better than that. And uh, <laughs> eventually I ended up with the rig that I used professionally. And so I got it out. It's been years since I've dragged it out of the cupboard, and which sounds terrible, you know. But it's, it's there, and I, I will probably redevelop an interest in, in photography again. But I was very much into it. So I, I grabbed the camera out, and it took me a little while to remember how to run the whole thing. But let's have a look at some of the pictures. So this one, first one is one of the batsmen, and you can see the ball flying off to his right, off to the screen's left. I think that's Nick, um, who plays for Sydney in his first grade. So that's one of the batsmen. And then I thought I'd just show you quickly a picture of one of the bowlers that I took yesterday. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with those. It's good fun. I, as I say, obsessive nature. It's, do, you, do you do anything that you think, this is great, but I can do it better? and I can do it better on top of when you thought you did it better, you think you can do it better again. Do you, do you strive for that or is good enough, close enough, good enough? I don't, it takes all sorts, it takes all sorts. What have we got next? Um, putting that on there and trimming it. What have we got? We've got another 10 to 15 minutes. So I, what I'll do in the meantime is I'll get I'll get that one that we've just put the pocket holes on, bring it up here. Thanks, David. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so what I'll do is I'll get that piece that we just did, and I'll show you the next process of what I do. And this is what, these are the 600 revos that I'll use. So with this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Stanton bench off now and go straight hard down on a flat surface. Uh, pop that over here. See, this is why I like to have things nice and tidy. Pop them down there. Put this on here. Uh, yes, it's a Nikon. It's a Nikon. It's a Nikon D810 that I use and a 500 millimeter f4 lens. So it's not a zoom, as it's not a variable zoom, it's a fixed focal length. So um, I can tell you the, the mathematics behind that lens if you wish. These days the photos or cameras have all sorts of weird science happening. So you can get a very long zoom to give you a good focal length in such a compact camera. You know, the, they're cheating a little bit, but the one that I have, the focal length, which is 500 millimeters, so that's from the sensor in the camera to the front lens is 500 millimeters. Now, it's an F4 lens, which is its aperture. That's, that's its largest opening in the aperture. So it's like an iris in your eye, Can large or small. Small is when it's very bright outside, open up large, so you let more light in, during night time. So the same kind of thing. Um, yes, very, very expensive, Andrew. That's why you have to get paid to do it. Like if I wasn't getting paid to do that job, well then I wouldn't, I would never have bought that gear. It's, it is very expensive. Um, so back to the aperture. So it's, it's most open aperture. So it can go from F4 all the way down. It's kind of back to front. Apertures work from the largest opening down to the smallest opening. So the smallest opening on mine, I think is around F32 or something, or F11, something like that. Very, very small aperture, but it's a larger number. Go figure. So F4, so you divide 500 by four, which is its aperture, and that is the diameter of the last lens, the last piece of glass away from the camera. So I used to have a 400 millimeter f2.8. So it'd be 400 divided by 2.8 is actually a larger piece of glass, allows more light in. Anyway, that's, uh, that's just that little bit of chat about photography. So 
I, all this information rattles around in my head. <laughs> F22, is it? Okay. It's a pretty big aperture for, for a 500 millimeter lens. Yeah. Um, I haven't got the camera down here with me. It's up in the office, but maybe next week I'll, I'll show you the lens and you can, it's, it's heavy. It's a heavy rig. I've got photos on the computer, but I'm not going to go mucking around now to drag it out. As I say, buy once, cry once. If, if you can afford it or if the situation presents itself to be able to do that kind of stuff. Sorby Pro has just arrived. That's my project sorter for the afternoon. Portable stand for it to move to his and hers life. Ben, you're going to love the Pro Edge. I, it's such a nice, 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 nice uh, sharpening system. Um, okay, so these are the sides. These are the sides for the unit that we're doing. And I've already put the tape on. And you notice that I still have, I still write the size on so that I know what's going on. And this one there, like so. 533. Let me see. I'm making sure that we've got it the right way around. Yeah, that was nearly another mistake. Turn it around this way. And that'll be right. I had it going the wrong direction. When something's nearly square, that's when it's really handy to have little signs on it because it can tell you the directions. Let's say, see, see the sign? I've got an arrow as well. I should have had that on here. Now, the back for this one. I think is one of these and I've already pocket holed it and I'm hoping it's the right one. Indeed it is. Lovely. I'm going to tip that camera down a little bit. But these days with phones the way they are, life is just it's too easy to take really nice photos. Just pull the, the best camera you've got is the one that's on you. Now, you're not going to see my head there, but it's probably going to be a blessing for a lot of people. I'll pull it up just a touch so we can see a little bit more of what's happening there. There we go. Okay, the clamps. And how I do this is I'll put a clamp around. Yeah, I'm just going to pull this all forward for the moment up to about there. Maybe go to Carl Camp. When I find the mouse. There we go. So I'm going to put a clamp at the bottom there. And I'm going to put a piece across the front so that these are perfectly aligned with the face. Actually, I will use a straight edge. So there's my straight edge. I'll pop him there and push back ever so slowly. Now everything is at the front perfectly. That's what I want. Pull this up. And do a light tighten. And then make sure that everything again is perfect at the front, which it wasn't. Good, good. Good, and then a little bit more of a tighten up there. Yeah, this is the back. This is the stuff up that's going at the back. All right. Um, but thank you for reminding me, guys. <laughs> uh, here we go. it up. Now, I'm not going to tighten it up too much here because the clamp is sitting on the table. And if I tighten it up too much, what's going to happen is it's going to start rolling these edges in. The back can't roll in because the back's holding it. All right, a little nip. Now, I can roll her over. Like so. And there's all the screws waiting to, to go in. Now I'm going to put another clamp here. Tighten him up. Let go of this one. 
And now bring it up so it's in line and not, not below. So now it's going to pull evenly. There we go. Okay, so that, 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 and that, and that. I can put all of the screws in there. And again, as I was saying, I'm using inch and a quarter. And I have the drill here, but I don't have a new battery in it, so it's probably going to go flat on me like it did last week. So for those wondering, I've got the clutch set on number five on the CXS. It's not six, it's five. And we're nearly ready for that other piece to come out of the clamps. Undo this one. This one, and then this one, over there, and it's going to pull this one and this one for me. And also there and there. So I'm going to put those in. Now you notice I've got these screw holes here ready to go as well. That's fine. It's, that's all part of the plan. <laughs> All right, put these in. Oh, there we go. One more here. Then we'll work on the back. Now that's going to be held together very, very well. Last thing to do is the back. Like so. Then we're going to put a clamp across here. Like so. And that should pull them all up. That's all good. So, and six more screws. This is something I had to do anyway, so I'm, I'm happy to keep going if you can stay awake. John, never an idiot, never an idiot. Only if you're watching someone else's videos. If you're watching other videos of mine, well, that's okay. <laughs> there we go, okay. So there we have our carcass ready for the draw front that's going to go on here. Now, you'll notice on the back, it's, it's in between. And this end is buried inside the cupboard. You're not going to see that. See, it's going to go in there. But the front is going to be seen. So we have to make very sure of that. So I'm going to take the clamps off it now. How about we do that so you guys can see. Push that down there. Swing the cameras around again. <laughs> John, you're too kind. All right, the spacer I'm going to take out. And then we've got this. 
Now the reason I don't use blue tape on these is it doesn't need it. So I get a chisel. And slide it. We go to Carl Cam again for this one, I think. So even the glue on melamine, it's not going to worry it. Now. Some people might think, well, you're going to have trouble fixing this drawer front on. So that's pretty good. A little bit more there. Flip her over, do the other side. Now again, when you get to the end, don't push too far because you might start tearing the tape off. Beautiful. Lovely. Now, I'm going to go down to the other end here. Give me a second. And bring this up to here. That should be fine there. Switch the cameras over again to camera three. Twist at a touch. That got you? Pretty much. Just a little bit more. All right, in here I've got, let me see what we've got there. That needs dressing, but we're gonna, we're gonna dress this in a second. First of all, we're gonna clean this off so it looks nice. I'll take that one out. So, now I put a large insert in to allow for better dust extraction. And we need to crank it up. Come on, lock on. Now, I don't want to come too high. I only want to come just past the, the Jarrah. So I've got, this is twin bearings. There we go. I'm making sure that the cutter, the, there's this tiny space between the underside of the bottom bearing and the top of the cutter. And that's at the perfect height. I'll shut that and lock the height of the router so it doesn't go anywhere. And I have my yellow safety device here. Turn the extractor on or open the port for it. That's that one. That one's shut. Just the underneath one working is great. And some eye muffs. This is a spiral, spiral up cutter, again, which means it, it's directing everything up to the router. So the, because the router is upside down, it's going to be pulling stuff down as well as the dust extractor, extractor working. So I will run this. Now, I'm going to start it here and pull it back, then run down the other side. 
If you're not confident using a router table, don't do this. Use a, a hand plane maybe and go this direction until you're almost on the tape and then just a little bit of sandpaper. So I would plane from this side and go that way with a low angle plane. But I'm pretty confident with this thing. Very nice. Make sure you approach the router from the right hand side across its face. Don't go from here that way, it'll grab in a small piece like this. Beautiful. And then I'm going to contact the cutter bearing from the part I've already done. So that has given me a very, very nice finish on both sides. I may need to just give it a light sand. Now I'm going to put it over the jointer and get rid of that rough finish there. Turn that slightly this way. I might be getting out of the image a little bit now. Uh, open that one up. I didn't even turn the dust extractor on, did I? There we go. I did this time. Go figure. <laughs> I've got it set to just under a millimetre. There you go. Looks great. Right, back here. All right, where are we up to? Uh, Dave, what distance do you have between Carl Cam and the bench top? Uh, it's close to four and a half feet. Let me have a look. It's 1300 millimeters. Yep. Oh, distance, distance, distance. Those photos that I took. Um, if you're interested in how far away I was using that camera, I'll tip this up just a touch so we can see Zoe's sign again uh, 80, uh, 80 yards or 80 meters same thing that's how far away I was so to give you a, a little bit more of an indication it's 1 22nd of a mile that's how far away unbelievable gear and you can see the eyelashes um, on, the, on the, the people that I take the photos of just amazing absolutely amazing when I started, I used to have what's called chromatic aberration around the images. So anything of white, there'd be a purple fringe all the way around the edge. Uh, roundover is going to happen. So what I'm going to do is when I put, assemble the drawer, I'll take it over to the other router table that will have the quarter inch round. And I will round from the, right the way down the front. But on the inside, I'll make sure that I'm not going to contact the melamine edging that I've got on the sides of the drawer. Okay because that would be a tragedy. Let me see if I've done it on this one. I'll show you. So this one already has the roundover in here. I don't know why that's happening. I'm getting two different images here from the screens. That's crazy. Okay, so it's rounded over. Um, yeah, there you go. So it makes it nice and nice to hold. Now, the next thing we're going to do is, before we do a roundover, obviously, we're going to glue and screw this onto here. So, how I go about that is on the edge that's going to be on the inside of the drawer, I get a bit of 120 gray paper. Okay, it's, That should say 120. It just says 20 at the moment. But it's 120. 
<clears throat> so I look for the best side, best face. And I think this is the best face because there is absolutely no chipping on the edges on this face where that's all, and I'll just give this a quick sand. The other side has a minimal chip. So that's the side I'm going to give it a quick rub with some paper. Right where the melamine is going to go. Or sorry, right where the edge is going to butt up and glue onto it. Because if you don't do this, it makes it hard for the glue to grab a hold of. See just here? So I'm going to now clean that. The compressor's decided it wants to join in. Start again. Give it a rub with a rag. Like so. And now we're going to pop it on top here. Fingers crossed it fits. Beautiful. Of course it does. Lovely. And we're going to work upside down again, but we're going to put some glue on first on the sides only. We're going to put glue on here and here, not here. If I put glue on there, it's going to make it too slippery for when I do the pocket hole screws. So I'm only going to glue the, and the pocket hole screws are going to work fine. I just want to glue the tops of the sides because I'm going to grab, that's going to be my handle. So let's do that. Back up to Carl Camp. I say, sorry, I'm going over it. I'm sorry. I just want to get it done. There. Down the sides. Of course, it's closed up. And the brush. I could put blue tape on the inside here, but again, it's not going to grip on, onto this. It will on the front down here because I've sanded it. Kind of etched through the glossy finish on it. Done. Quick drink. All right. My sanded, sanded sections, telltale with that little bit of uh, whiteness there, and it's going to the top. Oh, not yet, not yet. We've got to lay it down, like so. And <laughs> that way, keep your wits about you. And then it doesn't matter if it drops down a little bit here, just as long as underneath here, what's sitting on this bench. All of these four sides are all sitting on a dead flat surface. One of the reasons why I love this laminate top to assemble on, um, and also if I, if I didn't have this, what I'd do is I'd flip the Stanton bench over. I'd undo it and I would put, uh, flip it over because the other side doesn't have any of the rubber anti-slip on it. And that works brilliantly. Okay. A little bit there and it's it's it has pulled it a little bit that way as I was tightening it. Um, so on the other side I'll probably get a bit of pull back the other direction. Just quickly feeling that. No, it wasn't, Wayne. Oh, man, I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you're there. <laughs> Pull it off and rub it off that part. I'm glad I've got plenty of paper here to get rid of all this rubbish. Over there. Okay, see you later, Carl. A little bit of water. This is what I've got to use. So it's only going to take a second. That's gone. 
gone. Dry. Dry. Fixed. Fixed, you guys. Do you like the way I do these little human element things to, uh, to make everyone feel good about themselves? <laughs> no, that was a stuff up. That was a stuff up. Beautiful. You know, it may have grabbed, it may have worked, but not as well. <laughs> but not as well. No way as well as this stuff. Here we go. And I'm going to use a proper applicator this time. Beautiful. Done. Put the top on for the 5,000th time after I drop it down. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> and which side was it? It was that side because I can see, I can see here, it's not as glossy. That's not as glossy as this part. So down. Beautiful. Thank you, Wayne. And this time I'm going to go over the top this way to pull it up. And then I shouldn't get any sideways movement. I've just got to make sure that I don't have any lifting from the bottom. That's good. That's good. He did indeed, Peter. That's, that's holding down beautifully. One down the guts. Okay, now I can screw it all off. I mean, maybe I can fit this drawer this afternoon. We'll see. So all the mechanical work is being done by these three screws. So that's the mechanical bond. The other side, I'm going to put two more clamps on. This can come off now, it's not doing anything. A hundred and eighty people watching me do a stuff up. I don't care. I don't care. Wouldn't be the first time, not going to, it's not going to be the last time. And I'll put this on as well, up the top here. It's got that one, I'll get one more clamp. Oh, we all make stuff ups. <laughs> And there's our drawer. What's it like down the inside there? Pretty good. I have a, another rag here. Where was it? That I wanted to use. It's this one here. Bit of water on it. I find that using uh, cloth is a whole lot better than using paper towel for cleaning off residue as far as glue is concerned. I know people are going to say, Dave, what about using a straw? Well, I do that as well, but there wasn't enough really there to do it. Let's go to the next 
image here. So my embarrassed red face has disappeared now. You won't see that. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. I got it. Got it. Now that the drawer's assembled, and I'll, I'll give it a couple of hours to dry, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a uh, round over on the inside without running into the sides either side there, and one right across the front. Give it a light sand, a quick touch with some of the whittle wax that I've been using, which I'm really enjoying. You like finger painting technique, hey? <laughs> um, but what do you reckon? It's an easy way to build a drawer. It does the job. It's going to be full of stuff. No one's going to see the inside. Not that that's important, but you know, you always like stuff to look nice. But the important things are to label your pieces as you're going through. You can write on them if you want to with a pencil and just use something like um, acetone. That's all I use to clean lead pencil off. Uh, some people use methylated spirits. There's all sorts of different things. Um, but I think that's it. So na next thing I need to do is say goodbye to everyone. Thank you to all of my patrons. And, and, and. Um, we are going to have a Zoom meeting. I'll turn that on in about three or four minutes. So if you are one of my patrons, you can jump in on that meeting. We're going to have a chat. Uh, make Dave even more embarrassed. Rub his face in it. <laughs> okay. And uh, I think that's it. So look, next week, I don't know what we're going to have next week. I'll find something for us to do and uh, hopefully we'll keep it interesting, a little bit amusing. I'll make mistakes on purpose and wait for you to go, guys to point it out for me. <laughs> so look after yourselves. Be nice to each other. And I've got to come down to here. Look after yourselves. Be nice to each other. Subscribe to the channel. Give me a thumbs up if you want to. And I shall see you next week. Bye. Bye.